Good morning, Calvary. Welcome. For those of you that are still coming in, we're going to begin. Find your seats, please. As we begin our service with the lighting of our Advent candle. Last week, we lit the candle of hope, declaring that Jesus Christ comes to us with the hope of eternal life. And today, we light the candle of peace. The father of John the Baptist prophesied about his son when he was born. And he said this, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And when the angels announced to the shepherds on the night Jesus was born, they said, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. And Jesus himself in his ministry to us, told us, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. In me you may have peace. In the world you may have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. In the lighting of the candle of peace, we celebrate that Jesus Christ has come to bring ultimate peace between us and God by the forgiveness of our sin and to give us peace while we live in this earth waiting for his return. Let us rejoice in prayer that Jesus comes as our gift of peace. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that in this day we come in anticipation of that day when we celebrate your birth on the 25th of December. But we come because in Christ we celebrate every day that we have the hope of glory because of Jesus Christ and we have the peace of God that covers all of our sin and makes us his children forever because of what Jesus did when he came. He came to pay for our sin. And I thank you and praise you that today we have the peace of God that passes all human understanding and keeps our hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. And that peace fills us with joy. Amen. Please stand and let your joy be heard. Let's put our hands together, church, and sing this great Christmas song out to the King of Kings, the Mighty One. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive. Yes, he does. 
together. Jesus Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus Emmanuel, oh come let us adore you. One voice, one heart. Jesus Emmanuel, oh come let us adore We shout your praise, Father. We give you all the honor and glory. We praise you. Joy to the world. Would you join me in declaring the greatness of our God through this song? I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. Amen. Our God is an awesome God. He
is an awesome God. We believe our God is an awesome God. What if we turned into wine? He uh, opened the eyes. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. That's right. There's none like you. Our awesome God. Drop into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. There's none like you. Oh, we lift it up to you, Father. Our God. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. And you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power. Our God. Our God. Oh. Turned into wine. You open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. That's right, none like you. None like you. Into the darkness, into the darkness you shine. But out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. Oh, there's none like, none like you. Oh, we sing it out. Our God is greater, but our God is stronger. We got you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome and power. Our God, our God. And if, and it's greater. Our God is stronger, we got you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, oh yes, our God. It is, and if our God, and if our God is for us, then you could never stop us. And if our God is with us, then we will be standing there. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand again? What could stand again? What could stand again? What could stand again? Our God, our God is great. Is an awesome God, He reigns. Yeah. From heaven above, it's wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God, He reigns. From heaven above, it's wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God, our God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. We praise you.
Bonsoir. Before we pray, you may be seated. Do we really believe those words? Do we really believe that our God is an awesome God? And not just awesome like we would call something else is awesome. He is his own awesome. And he is awesome enough to do something powerful in your life and something powerful that we discussed with you last week. So before we have our prayer for our offering, I need you to draw your attention to the envelope and the sheet in your connector. Because these envelopes, whether they are uh, filled with something today or they are empty, they need to be turned into the offering plate so we can reuse them. So everyone take these out of your connector and get ready to put them into the offering plate. Last week, we had a great update on a financial gift that was given and a restructuring of our mortgage terms and no longer needing to have a cash reserve on hand. And we are able to make an additional $175,000 payment to our mortgage, leaving us with that's right leaving us with a balance of three hundred and sixty one thousand and three hundred and sixty one thousand dollars the elders and deacons know that we are supposed to focus on debt retirement and so we've asked you is it possible through the generosity of everyone in this room is it possible through the power of our awesome God to pay an additional hundred and fifty thousand before year end and we believe it's possible and so some of you have already put some money in here and you've been able to give what you can and we love that. Please turn it in today. But if this is empty, please turn it into the offering plate or take it home and prayerfully consider if you can put an extra $3 in or you can put an extra $300,000 in because our God is awesome enough to do that. So would you gather with me in prayer for our tithes and offerings? Father, sometimes we get caught just singing songs because they're familiar, but in this place today, I know that every one of us believes that you are an awesome God. Not awesome like we describe other things, but you are your own awesome. There is no one like you. Nothing can stop you. No one compares to you, God. That's who we're here to worship. That's who has called us to be part of his incredible plan, an awesome God. And so, Father, this morning as we as we obediently give back what you have given us, we look forward to how you are going to be glorified. We give knowing that you are going to do incredible things. We don't need recognition. We don't need to have things our way. We only need to know that we serve an awesome God who is going to be victorious and already is victorious. Thank you, Father, for this united body of believers who gathers in Jesus' name. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, while the offerings plates are being passed, I would like to draw your attention to your connector for just a few announcements this morning. I already went through our debt retirement campaign for the month of December. If you have more questions about that, please feel free to contact any of the elders or deacons uh, or pastors, but read that insert in your connector, please. Uh, also, Coming up is the Kids Link Christmas program. Uh, actually, I forgot. You know what? I'm glad that screen is back there. We have an additional part of this debt retirement challenge. We have one of our deacons who has a beautiful head of hair. He has vowed that if we can hit that goal of $150,000 extra by the end of the year, he will look like this. Now, if you don't know Scott, you may think that that's normal for him, but it is not. Scott's right up here in the front, and uh, he usually heckles us while we're preaching. Um, and so he is, uh, he is committed to this campaign. I am encouraging the other deacons that if we can pay off the whole mortgage, that the whole deacon board shaves their heads. But I haven't gotten approval for that yet, okay? But let's make Scott shave his head, okay? Wouldn't that be great? All right. Coming up is our Kids Link Christmas program, uh, and that's next Sunday, and it will be as uh, it will be the morning worship service next Sunday. A couple things to draw your attention to: practices, parents. If you have kids that have been part of the practice in the back, we're going to have practice next Saturday morning, the fifteenth at nine a.m. from nine to eleven, and then during our Faith Builders Hour next Sunday, the kids are going to practice starting at eight forty-five in this sanctuary. So if your class meets in here as an adult class, you will be meeting in the back kids area 
and I'll make sure you don't have those tiny little chairs, okay? We'll, we'll take care of that. So that's coming up next Sunday in practices, uh, as I mentioned. Also coming up is Christmas caroling. This is an all-church event that our AIM mission team has put together. If you want to come and go caroling, it's next Saturday at 3.45. We will leave the church, and then you'll be returning here for a nice little potluck soup dinner. Can't go wrong with that on a cold day. So let's bless the people in our community and some of our shut-ins, and let's go caroling together next Saturday at 3.45. Also coming up, Christmas Eve service. I don't need to tell you the date of that, but at 4.30 is our Christmas Eve service, and uh, we are focusing on the Prince of Peace. So make sure on Monday, Christmas Eve, you are here at 4.30 to celebrate with us. Those are all of the official announcements. There's much more in your calendar, in your connector, but at this time, I would ask for our kids who are uh, involved in our DiscoverLink ministry, you can be dismissed right now. Parents, would you escort them back to our KidsLink uh, ministry? And the rest of you, would you please stand as we continue in worship? See together 
has come, I sing. Hope has come unto us, unto us. Love, love is born. We rejoice, we rejoice. Light of my salvation, breaking through the night. The light, light of my salvation is breaking through the night. Yes, the light. Of Father, you have come unto us. For as we read from the lips of Jesus himself, no one has ever seen the Father. But the one and only God who sits at the right hand of the Father has revealed him to us. Jesus, you came so that we could know God. Thank you that you came unto us as a wonderful counselor to bring us the wisdom we need for life. Today, in a moment, when we open up your word and discover that you are not only the God with the right words, you are the mighty God with the power to enforce and apply those words to bring about the deliverance of your people. Redemption song, sung when Jesus came unto us. And we hear it and are delivered from our sins. And we give you praise. Amen. Please be seated. Remain in a spirit of prayer for a moment. We have a couple of requests that we want to pray for. Uh, first of all, would you please be in prayer for our dear brother and IT director, Dave Schoen, uh, it has been now over two weeks that our, uh, our server has been on lockdown because of a serious security breach. And uh, it has, uh, uh, it's, and Dave is just doing absolutely everything possible. Uh, if, if you don't understand IT, you won't understand this. If you do understand IT, you will understand the depths to which this has gone. Uh, the depths to which this breach of security has gone is that we actually, this last week, we actually received a, an email with malware attached to it that would have put us into one of those uh, uh, blackmail type situations with our server and with our church. And that email came to us from Homeland Security, and they didn't even know that they had been compromised, and Dave found it. That's the gift that God has given to us. Now Homeland Security is involved. It's been elevated to the highest levels of security across our country through Microsoft and Homeland Security, and they're still looking for the people that have perpetrated this against our church for some reason. So please, would you pray for Dave Schoen and for our church? So over the last two and a half weeks, if you have a Calvary email address, it's been on lockdown, or it should have been. Uh, I haven't received emails for two and a half weeks. I have a personal email address. You can ask me for it if you want to use that for communication. But if you've tried to communicate with our church through email for the last uh, two and a half weeks, we don't know it. So we're not avoiding you on purpose. We just don't know you're looking for us. So uh, use uh, an, an old-fashioned form of personal contact called a telephone. <laughs> okay? Thank you. Um, I know it's a little outdated. And it's a little hard maybe to, to talk to people face-to-face, -face, but we really prefer that at this time. So pray about that, and then would you also pray for our brother Ed Slifer? He's sitting in the back, back over here. Uh, his um, uh, dear friend Cliff that we have been praying for, uh, he passed away this week. And so pray for Ed as he continues to try to reach out to Cliff's family and to minister the gospel to them. So let's just spend a moment, pray silently for a moment for those two things, and then I'll close.
Father, I thank you for the gifts you've given to our people, or to our church rather, in qualified people that make it possible for us to expand the gospel around the world. But when the gospel of Jesus Christ goes out, the enemy attacks. And we pray that we will see resolution soon to the issue of uh, this uh, cyber terrorism that is taking place, not just for us, but for many other companies that are dealing with the same issues right now. And, and we pray that nothing will deter us from what the awesome God has called us to accomplish for his glory. And I pray for my dear friend Ed, that as he reaches out to minister to Cliff's family and talks to them and shares the love of Jesus with them, that you will just give Ed a peace that, that uh, will pass all the human understanding that he can then pass on to those family members. We know that many others that are here today have come with a variety of needs and issues. And I thank you that last week we learned that Jesus Christ is our wonderful counselor. May people turn to the wisdom that Jesus Christ has for their lives and then be willing to obey as our mighty God applies that wisdom to the activity of their life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I just said to the Lord, I'll say again to you, last week we learned that uh, we have this wonderful counselor that has come unto us, the theme of our uh, Christmas series this year, Unto Us. And I'm so glad that Pastor James Allen found that song and uh, that we just sang. I know it was brand new to probably 99% of us in here, but we were able to focus in on the words and realize how magnificently it expresses Isaiah 9, 6, that unto us has come this redemption. And today, we want to move from Jesus Christ being our wonderful counselor who has come unto us, the one who has the wisdom to know how to bring his glory out of every situation of your life, to being the mighty God. And what is the connection? Just very simply, it is this. Knowledge must be applied to be useful. Knowledge must be applied to be useful. And today we're going to see that Jesus Christ, as our wonderful counselor, who, as Pastor Josh said last, last week, knows everything about everything and he's always right. He knows everything about everything and he's always right. But today we learn that as the mighty God, he has the infinite power necessary to apply his infinite knowledge to every aspect of life and bring victory. He has the power to deliver on what he knows. Turn with me to Psalm 24. Psalm 24. And we're going to read uh, this whole psalm, 10 verses as the foundation for this mighty God that we read about in Isaiah 9, 6, when we find his name shall be called Mighty God. But uh, we're going to read Psalm 24. We're going to stand as we do, but before we do, does anyone need a Bible? Put your hand up really high and someone will bring a Bible. Do we have any Bibles left, by the way? Uh, if not, we're going to get some more ordered. Deacons, don't worry. I had somebody hand me enough money to buy Bibles for quite a while this morning, and they're going to pay for them. So praise God for that. So uh, if you need a Bible, do we have any? I guess, I guess we don't have any. There's some in the youth room, okay? Uh, there's, there's one gentleman over here for sure that needs a Bible. Uh, hold your hand up until uh, Dan Cope runs the marathon back there that he's trained for so hard. Okay? Psalm 24. And we'll read together, follow along on the screen until your Bible gets here. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands 
and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. You may be seated. Now, honest confessions from all of you who were ever in choir. How many of you were singing the Messiah as we read those verses in, in your brain, right? You, I, I was doing the same thing. Aren't you glad I kept it inside? <laughs> I was blessed today, this week, to challenge one of my grandchildren who I know loves academics. And I was challenged when I told her to look up this week on the internet a poem that I had studied when I was in school. And I told her the name of the poem, and she says, oh, I love that poem. I've read it. I love it. I said, do you know how it ends? And she actually quoted the last line to me. I was so impressed. I don't know how many of the rest of you will know this, but it was written by William Ernest Henley, and the poem is called Invictus. When Henley was 16 years old, his left leg required amputation due to complications arising from tuberculosis. In the early 1870s, after seeking treatment for problems with his other leg, he was told that it too would require a similar procedure. And in August of 1873, instead of having his leg amputated, he chose to travel to another city to enlist the services of a distinguished English surgeon by the name of Joseph Lister. And he was able to save Henley's remaining leg with multiple other kind of surgical interventions. And while he was recovering from those surgeries in the infirmary, he was moved to write the verses of this poem that became Invictus. And the author uses strong and descriptive language. He uses extravagant metaphors to clearly convey that we should never lose hope no matter the circumstance and to convey for him his truth that we control our fate and we decide our future. And the poem goes like this. Out of the night that covers me, black as a pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this veil of wrath and tears clings but the harrow of the shading. Yet the menace of the years finds in self I meet unafraid. Matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Now those are brave words, albeit foolish bravery. For history shows us that the man who wrote them ended up taking his own life in suicide in utter despair that he could not achieve the outcomes he thought he needed. Who is the captain of your soul? Who is the one truly in control? Are you growing weary today and losing heart because of what's going on in life? Are you facing some seemingly insurmountable mountain of difficulty? 
Is there an impossible situation in a relationship with your spouse or a family member, a friend or a co-worker? And what you need today may not be more wisdom or more counsel. But what you may need today is the application of the wisdom that's already been given to you. And yet when we seek to turn that counsel into action as the captain of our own soul, we soon discover our weakness to bring about any permanent resolutions. What we need is someone who is truly mighty to deliver. We need a mighty God. Isaiah 9, 6 tells us that unto us comes a mighty God. Let's break down that term, mighty God, for a moment from the original language. For unto us comes a mighty God, and that word in the, in the Greek language is some of you are studying the names of God, and maybe you've already studied this recently, but it's El Gabor. And that means this, a God who is powerful. And if you have your fill-in sheets, you're already at the point where you should be filling in blanks. And unfortunately, my blanks didn't get underlined like Pastor Josh does his, so I'll make that correction for next week so you know what blanks to fill in. We have a God who is powerful. We have a God who conquers. We have a God who is our champion. When you take all of the nuances of the word El Gabor in the Old Testament, the God who conquers, the God who is our champion, the God who delivers, the God who is powerful, that's the summation of what his name means. But if we're going to get the full context of what it means, we need to go back to what it meant to the people who first heard it. And Isaiah was writing to the people of Israel who, within the context of their national history, had an understanding of what it means to be a powerful conqueror and deliverer. For this name, when used in the Old Testament to define God, is used primarily to describe the one who will come in the lineage of King David to establish his kingdom. And to understand it from the context of the Jewish nation, David was, and to this day, still is considered Israel's mighty conqueror. When Pastor Josh and I were in Israel a year ago, at this very time, I believe it was, we went to the place where these pictures were taken. You can see the statue of King David with the harp sitting outside the place where King David's tomb is said to exist. And there's actually a concrete mason tomb there in which they believe are the bones of King David in this place. And there are scribes and and religious people that sit outside that tomb area in a library and they're doing research and studying because to them... David still represents the might of God to conquer and bring deliverance. David's life illustrated that. He was a shepherd who killed a lion and a bear. He was chosen by God and anointed king. He killed Goliath and defeated the Philistines. He rescued the people of Ziklag who had been captured by the Amalekites. He was the one who captured Jerusalem and built the palace there and made it Israel's capital. He brought the Ark of the Covenant away from the Philistines and returned it to Jerusalem. He conquered, ultimately, the Philistines and the Moabites and the Syrians. And he defeated the combined armies of the Ammonites and the Assyrians. And he brought to the nation of Israel, for the first time, a peace and security that no one else had ever been able to accomplish. David was Israel's mighty conqueror. And as we study Scripture, one of the fascinating things to me has always been, and I think I learned this love from my grandfather because some of his books that he gave me uh, are, are I, I, 
years ago, I, I gave away a, a bunch of all my books in my library when we downsized and had, didn't have library space, and so I gave away a bunch of books, and, but I kept all of the books that have to do with what we call biblical typology, the types of the Bible. What do we mean by type? David is a type of Christ. And what do we mean by that when we talk about the types of the Bible? Let me just give you a, a little bit of theology this morning and then we'll get back on topic. What do we mean by type? The word type is used to denote a resemblance between something present or past and something future. So when you study the life of King David, for example, you're given in an illustration of his life a typology of what the future fulfillment will be in the life of Jesus Christ himself. For example, the whole Old Testament sacrificial system is a typology of what Jesus did on the cross to pay the ultimate sacrifice so we no longer need the Old Testament sacrificial system. That's the typology. That's what we're talking about. And so the reason I lay that down for you is because if we're going to understand who this mighty God is that comes unto us as the conqueror and deliverer for our lives, how does King David play into that? If you were to read some verses from the Old Testament, you would find many, many that describe King David in prophetic terms of what Jesus would one day be like. And in Psalm 18, 89, we read this, For our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One of Israel. Of old you spoke in a vision to your godly one and said, I have granted help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil I have anointed him so that my hand shall be established with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. That was fulfilled in the day of David. It will ultimately be fulfilled in the messianic reign of Jesus Christ on the kingdom on earth when he returns to, to establish forever the throne of David. He is the fulfillment of what we see in King David in the Old Testament. And so I, I lay that out for you because for me it was important to understand the fulfillment of this term, mighty God to conquer, to put it into the typology of the Old Testament says, David was the conqueror and deliverer of the nation of Israel to bring them peace and security. How will Jesus do that for me? How will he be the mighty one who will deliver me into a place of peace and security for all eternity? And that's how Jesus comes. The New Testament people understood that Jesus came as the fulfillment of David. When on his triumphal entry, they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest! They understood it, even though they still had the wrong context. So what I need for you to do to, for me today is to make sure that we're in agreement about what the ultimate context is of Jesus' deliverance as the mighty God. You see, when Jesus comes as the wonderful counselor, he comes with all the wisdom you need because he knows everything about everything and he's always right, he comes with all the wisdom that you need to apply to every minute detail of your life and find hope and confidence that he is at work to bring about an outcome that he desires for his glory. However, we tend to want to build that house of all the right structures of wisdom to give me security without laying the ultimate foundation of deliverance that Jesus Christ came to give, and that is the salvation of our souls from sin. Ultimately, the wonderful counsel of God about the situations of your life cannot be applied 
until the foundation of Jesus Christ resolving your sin issue with him has been completely absolved. And so, as we study who our mighty conqueror is, we look at three things that Jesus conquers. Well, I guess we look at one thing with three principles. Number one, unto us comes our mighty conqueror so that he, Jesus, can conquer our enemies. He conquers our enemies. Now again, remembering context, your mind might be going right now to a picture of a person who is your enemy. Please destroy that in your brain right now. Do not be thinking in that direction because that's not ultimately and foundationally what Jesus came to destroy. That's not the enemy we're talking about. There are three enemies that Jesus came to destroy. The first one is this, Satan and the forces of evil. He came to destroy and conquer Satan and the forces of evil. In Revelation chapter 12, in this prophetic picture that looks back at something that happened in heaven, we read these words, Now war arose in heaven, and Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Woe to you, O earth and sea! For the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Your enemy is not the government. Your enemy is not the economic policies of any of your politicians. Your enemy is not a religious nation in this world. Your enemy is not your boss. Your enemy is not whatever else you think or whomever else you think is your enemy. That is not your enemy. Your enemy is Satan. He has been cast out of heaven because of his rebellion because of his desire to be equal with God and receive the glory of God for himself. And he has, according to Scripture, come down to this earth with great wrath to seek and devour those that he can devour. And he is seeking to destroy you. And when you come to Christ for salvation, guess what? He can't. He can't. There is no power in heaven or in earth that can undo what Jesus Christ has done when you have been forgiven for your sin and you stand before him as his eternal child. There is no power that can undo that. Satan has no authority over your life. But oh, how we give in to what he says we need from this world how we give in to the temptation to be the captain of our own soul and the master of our own destiny and the determiner of our own outcomes. And we wonder why we have problems because every time we focus on we and I focus on me and what I want and what I get to do and what I want to achieve and how I want that to turn out and how I want that to look and how I hope that will be, I have said to God, I am God, which is absolute, 100% total, unanimous agreement with what Satan said that got him cast out of heaven. I want to be God. Do you understand the danger of such living? and such thinking. But Jesus came to conquer that thinking. In Revelation 19, it tells us, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron." He is coming as our conqueror to conquer every force 
that ever stood opposed to him and to us. Hebrews tells it this way in Hebrews chapter 2. Since therefore the children, that's us, share in flesh and blood, he himself partook of flesh and blood, of the same things. God became human flesh, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Do you see the deliverance in there? Our mighty God has come, and when he died on the cross, and when he rose from the dead, he conquered not just death, he conquered all the power and the authority of the one who holds death in his hands. Do you remember the song by Steve Green from years and years and years ago? He holds the keys of life and death. Satan no longer has authority over you. You do not need to live in the bondage of fear, wondering what the consequences are of all of your choices and all of your sin. You do not need to live in the guilt and the shame of your sins of the past. You do not need to live at all under the conviction and the bondage of that fear of punishment. Jesus Christ, the mighty God, the wonderful counselor who has the words of wisdom for you and the power to apply those words of wisdom will deliver you from all consequences of sin and give you eternal life immediately. And because of that, in Christ, we are also able to conquer Satan, the accuser. We are able to conquer Satan, who is our accuser. In Revelation 12, we read these words of what's going to happen during a period of time when there is great persecution of Christians on the earth, and I believe we already live in those days. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God and they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony for they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Let me give you two points that aren't on your paper just as a as an encouragement to you that come out of this verse as to what you have to do to live in victory with Jesus Christ as your conqueror over all of the power of the enemy in your life. Two things you have to do. Testify that Jesus Christ is your king and not any of that. Testify to it. Speak it out loud. Tell people. Don't sit in your living room like I do sometimes and go, oh man, life stinks. Life just stinks. Where's this? Where's that? Why didn't that turn out? Why did that person say that to me and I blame them for causing this great discouragement that's going on in my life? And we've all been there. We all do that. We all are very quick to proclaim out loud what's wrong with life when we overcome the enemy by the word of our testimony about who we are in Christ, not about who we are in the world. What's the word of your testimony in your life every day? And then the second thing you need to do when you're speaking that word of testimony is to understand that you're so in love with the life Jesus has for you in eternity that you don't care how this life on earth turns out and the problem is that in the church today, we have way too many of us that believe that this life has to turn out right. That this life has to somehow make sense. And that this life has to have some kind of fulfilling and defining moment to it. And what did Jesus say here? They conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, because they loved not their lives, even though it brought them death. They loved not their lives, even though it brought them death. And if you're in Christ, the mighty God can bring that kind of victory to your life. Well, not only did Jesus come to conquer our enemy of Satan and his forces of evil, but he also came to conquer the world. So that 
we don't love life in this world quite so much. And maybe by growing into the character of Christ, we learn not to love life in this world at all so that we live only the eternal life of Christ that is coming out of us. Jesus said in John 16, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Wait a minute. I have, past tense, overcome the world. So what does it mean? What does it mean when I choose to let the world influence me? I'm choosing at that moment not to accept the reality that Christ already overcame that and so it doesn't have to have any effect on me and I'm going to let it have an effect on me because Christ's power really isn't all that awesome. He's really not that much of an awesome God that he can really do that for me. He can overcome that financial crisis. He can overcome that health crisis. He can overcome that to bring me to the point of such peace with him that nothing in the world really matters. That's the mighty God we serve. He is that mighty to give us that kind of an attitude and that kind of a perspective on life. The Apostle Paul understood it when he wrote probably one of the most popular passages of Scripture in all of the Bible when we're in trouble. And we read it, and then we pray, God, please make this real to me. Uh, now, before I read the passage of Scripture, let me just remind you that when you ask God to make a passage of Scripture real to you, He's going to continue to do whatever He needs to do to make it real to you. And so if He needs to teach you not to depend so much upon the world so that you can depend on Him, He's going to make more of your dependence upon the world miserable. When what we're really looking for is for it not to be so miserable. But no, then you ask God, show me what you want me to know. Show me how to apply this to my life. He's going to continue whatever circumstances are necessary so you'll learn it. So if you don't want to know it, don't ask him. <laughs> but then know this about God. He loves you so much, he's going to keep doing it anyway because he's never going to let you stop. You might as well participate with him in being able to say this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in eh, most of these things, we're more than... Con no, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He is our mighty God. And you need that kind of hope today, that Jesus has overcome the world. Well, the final enemy that Jesus has overcome is death itself. Death itself. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul's great statement about the resurrection, he says this, For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, raised from the dead. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, where he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Someday, someday, you and I, whether from a grave 
whether from an urn or whether from a pulpit, will be resurrected. And we will be transformed into the very likeness of Jesus Christ, who in his resurrection body was no longer subject to any of the confines of created time and space. He dwells now in his eternal existence in physical form, and one day we don't know what we shall be, but we do know this, we shall be like him because we will see him as he is. And he will conquer for all of us death. Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians 15 and says this, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. But I tell you, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound. I'm just, just making sure I didn't hear it. And the dead will be raised imperishable. The dead will be raised imperishable. And we shall be changed. Anybody singing the Messiah again? For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality. And when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Death has no power over us. Unto us has come a mighty God with the words of wisdom and the power to deliver those words into the reality of your life. Robert Louis Stevenson, one of my favorite old-time authors, told a story one time about passengers who were on a ship in a severe storm. They were in imminent danger of sinking. And the passengers were whispering, are we going down? Are we safe? And one passenger said, I've got to find out. So he made his way topside across the heaving decks in the waves, hanging on for dear life, showered with the spray of the ocean water. And he made his way to the pilot house, the bridge, where the pilot of the ship had his hand firmly on the wheel. The pilot turned and saw the fear in the passenger's face. And without speaking a word, with peace coming forth from his inner being, simply smiled at him. And the passenger left and went back to his friends below deck. And on arriving, he exclaimed, We're going to be all right. I've seen the face of the pilot. We're going to be all right. I've seen the face of the pilot. What we need to do when we are crippled by fear, caused by difficult circumstances, is to look away from the stormy waves and instead to look into the serene face of our Jesus, our mighty God, the one who is always mighty to save. We need to see the reassuring smile of our Savior who alone is mighty to calm the storms. And our mighty God who is able to calm the storm around us will more importantly calm the storm within us because he has already sailed rougher seas than you and I are in right now. Corey Ten Boom said it this way, Look at the world, you'll be distressed. Look within, you'll be depressed. Look at Christ, you'll be at rest. Jesus Christ, our wonderful counselor, who knows our need and has all the right answers, is our mighty God who puts his wisdom into action and delivers us. In Zephaniah chapter 3, there's a verse that says this, The Lord your God is in your midst, 
a mighty one who will save. Remember I started the sermon by reading the poem Invictus about being the master of your own fate and the captain of your own soul? Let me share with you a Christian version of Invictus to close. Out of the light that dazzles me, bright is the sun from pole to pole. I thank the God I know to be for the Christ, the conqueror of my soul. Since he's the sway of circumstance, I would not wince nor cry aloud. Under that rule which men call chance, my head with joy is humbly bowed. Beyond this place of sin and tears, that life with him, and he's the aid that spite diminished of the years keeps and shall keep me unafraid. It matters not, though straight the gate, he cleared from punishments the scroll. Christ is the master of my fate, Christ the captain of my soul. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you that we are not responsible for determining our outcome, for that is only destined to loss. Jesus Christ came as our mighty God, mighty to save. And in this place or out there somewhere, there is someone who says, I cannot have that kind of hope. I have been the captain of my own soul, the one who determines my own fate. And today... You, as that person, hear the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. How's that working out for you? And you realize you no longer want to be the captain of your soul. But there is one who came with not only the words of counsel, but the might and the power of all eternity to bring to reality everything he knows to be true. What you have been shown is that you know it's true. You're a sinner. And you are lost. You are deserving of God's just wrath against sin, which is death. But Jesus Christ came as the mighty God to save. And he paid for that sin. And he rose from the dead to conquer the death of that sin. And he will apply his resurrection life to your life if you will just repent and turn in your captain bars and let go of the driving mechanism of your life and give it to Jesus and receive his forgiveness and be saved from your sin. And today you say, Pastor, that's me. You have just described me and I have just prayed that Jesus save me and be the captain of my soul. While everybody's head is bowed and nobody's looking around, so you're not embarrassed to say this, would you just put your hand up and say, Pastor, I just did that. I just gave up the rule of my life. Thank you. And I have received Jesus Christ and his forgiveness. He, today, is my deliverer from sin. Anybody else that has done that? Yes, thank you. You can put your hand down then. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Yes, thank you. You can put your hand down. If you raised your hand, would you make sure you come talk to me before you leave today and just tell me what God just did in your heart and I can rejoice with you? Father, thank you for your deliverance from sin. You come not just with words of advice, but you come with the authority and the power to enforce everything you know to be right. Thank you for the hope that you've given us today that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And that in Jesus Christ, 
We no longer have to give in to the ways of the world. We serve a risen Savior, and one day we will rise with him. And with that hope, we proclaim we have a God who is mighty to save. Please stand.
Father, we praise and we believe you. We believe that with all our hearts that you are mighty to save. You are the mighty one above all. Father, now we ask as we leave this place to share that with the world around us that there is a mighty God who loves them, who died for them, who will return to take us all home, who has defeated sin and sin in the grave and death, and who is risen Savior that loves us with all we are and with all he is. And we're wonderful. Everyone says, Amen. You are dismissed. Savior. Savior. He can.